we're going to have an interesting time here because uh, this is the first time I've given this talk, and usually every time I give a talk for the first time, it's got some rough edges around it because I prepared it within hours of giving it. Um, so uh, the good news is that I'm giving this talk tomorrow, so if you feel like not watching me fail potentially here, you can come to LinkedIn in Mountain View tomorrow and watch me give the same talk over again. Uh, or you can go to New York in a week uh, from Thursday, and I will be giving the same talk there. They're going to get a really good show. So, um, so, and and Rob's going to be everywhere with me. So you can also see Rob speak at in Mountain View and in New York as well. Um, he's going to be talking to us about something just as cool, if not cooler, than what I'm going to be talking about. So, um, my talk is titled "Taming CSS and Ember JS Apps," and really. Um, this is like burying the lead a little bit, I think, of a title. Um, I have been, uh, well, I should introduce myself. Um, Bryn, um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. I've trained a lot of people probably here. Um, I do Ember training and consulting. I have been doing that stuff uh, for basically five years almost now, if not over that. Uh, I've been involved in the Ember project basically from the day it came out and have been a longtime member of the Ember JS core team. Um, so uh, warning, I have a lot of controversial, controversial viewpoints about CSS that you're going to be subjected to during this talk. Um, this may be one of the talks that I regret giving, um, <laughs> but Somebody needs to give a talk like this, I think, and um, so here I am uh, to kind of share with you the thoughts about CSS that I've been formulating over the last year that I've been in seclusion. Um, I was at EmberConf and many people were like, where have you been, man? And the answer is I've been thinking very deeply about CSS. Um, <laughs> And, and it's not been necessarily a great time. It's had its ups and downs, but I'm very excited to be sharing with you what, I've, what my current thoughts are on CSS today. So, um, quick plug. I'm doing a very cool little advanced Ember.js mentorship program. Check out this page if you're interested. It starts June 7th. It's kind of innovative. It's six weeks, two days a week for two hours a day. And we're gonna build four apps. It's pretty cool. So if you're looking for advanced training, this is the place to go. So, who likes CSS here? Raise your hand. Good. There's a lot of reasons to like CSS. Uh, I'm going to hate on it a bit, uh, but not too much. Uh, really, I think CSS is a remarkable technology, and you can see uh, our friends in native land like CSS quite a bit. And they like it so much that a lot of times mobile and native apps will just do a ton of stuff in web views because it's easier to lay out content on the web than it is on any other platform. Okay, so CSS is something to be cherished, but it needs some help to scale, I would say. Um, so <laughs> it's awesome, right? Um, Metaphor. Um, this is how I write CSS usually. Um, I mean, you know, I've actually been very spoiled um, by CSS. Um, and, uh, and, and primarily, I shouldn't say I've been spoiled by CSS. I've been spoiled by the teams that I've gotten to work on because I usually, probably over the last five years of being like an Ember expert, the amount of CSS I've written is probably ridiculously small in comparison. Um, and I want to change that, and that's kind of why, basically I feel powerless to some extent. When I want to build a web application, and I want to do it on my own over a weekend, I feel powerless to do so because I didn't accumulate the wealth of knowledge that the really great CSS wizards on the teams that I've worked on already had. And I want to build something that lets me, as somebody who doesn't want to be an expert in CSS, do amazing things like they can. Okay, so I feel like I'm doing web development in assembly still, despite the fact that we have all this great tooling on the JavaScript 
and markup side with Ember and HTML bars. And um, you might as well, I feel like I might as well just kill myself right now <laughs> instead of write CSS um, for a reasonably complex application. Um, so I think a perhaps better title for this talk might be CSS, the good parts. Um, I pay homage to uh, those who have come before me um, with this title, but I think um, really my controversial viewpoint, probably number one of the evening, uh, is that the, basically the number one best thing about CSS right now are classes. Uh, classes are amazing. I'm gonna touch on this a bit more. I have a very controversial opinion, which is that you should basically write no CSS that is not a class. So do not use IDs, do not use element-based selectors, and in fact, I would go so far as to say, do not even use descendant selectors in any way, shape, or form. Treat CSS as if it was a key hash. The keys are your CSS classes, the values are your property buckets of rules, okay? What's the second best thing? Basically nothing, all right? Uh, classes are the way you should write CSS. Um, you should not write it any other way. And I'll try to elaborate on this a bit more, um, but I have some patterns, I think, that, I, that are the way you should write CSS, and I'm gonna try to touch on as much of that in the 30 minutes that I have. Um, so, uh, so again, my name is Eric, I have a problem, and that problem is CSS, and I think the first step to solving this problem is to accept that you have the problem, and I'm curious how many of you raise your hands if you feel like you have a CSS problem, right? I mean, I feel like, who, so when I do training and stuff, usually when I ask a question in the affirmative, people will not raise their hand, so I'm curious, are there too many people do? If you do not think you have a CSS problem, raise your hand, please. Who does not have a CSS problem? All right, well, do you guys keep your hands raised if you think you're an expert at CSS, right? So basically, the people that don't have CSS problems are the CSS experts, right, who have figured out the right pattern for them to write CSS in as bulletproof of a manner as possible, right? I want to bake patterns like that into the way that we write CSS in Ember applications so that if you learn Ember, you learn how to write CSS in the maximally uh, you know, uh, successful way that you will avoid every possible you know, uh, pothole that you'll, you're gonna run into, right? So we're gonna try to talk a bit about what I think that is, all right? So we have a problem. What are the problems with CSS? This is a short enumeration of the high-level problems. CSS is globals-based programming. What do I mean by this? Every CSS rule you define is like defining a global variable on the window in JavaScript, okay? The rules that you define are tech debt. Every rule you write becomes tech debt the second you write it. And the worst part about this is that they're globals, right? It's a disaster. So I have a controversial viewpoint, which is that basically you should not write any global CSS. The only global CSS that I believe is allowed is like font. Font and font size on the body or HTML element, that's the only global CSS you should probably ever write. So what else? So it's obviously globals is a problem, and the reason that globals are a problem is because we lack modularity. We lack mechanisms to have encapsulation and isolation in CSS, all right? So I'm gonna prescribe some ideas for that. Dead code removal. Who has ever successfully deleted CSS without breaking your application? Raise your hand. <laughs> all right, that is a problem. We should be able to do that. Who has ever successfully refactored CSS that other people relied on and did not break what they were doing? Raise your hand. <laughs> all right, nobody raised their hand. We have a problem here, people, right? This is general programming stuff that we should have a grasp on in 2016, yet we do not yet with CSS, right? This is very problematic. A lot of my initial thinking was influenced by this talk by a member of the, uh, the React.js core team. Um, I think this is a great talk. If you haven't seen it, 
the slides. The slides are pretty good. They enumerate a lot of the problem space that we're trying to tackle, and they do prescribe some solutions. I do not agree with some of them, but I agree with others. To be clear, you might notice this thing is called CSS and JavaScript. I do not think CSS and JavaScript is the answer. I think it's actually a bad idea, but I understand why they think it's a good idea. And I've been there at times. That's like hitting the, you know, that's like writing CSS and JavaScript is like the extreme escape valve for kind of solving some of these problems. But I've challenged myself to not go that route and to find solutions that work in CSS today, pragmatic things that we can do today to start, challenge, to start solving this problem. So, globals. So, everything in CSS is global. So, the best thing we can do is to write globally unique class names, right? There are conventions like BEM or SMACs or whatever that prescribe rules for naming classes globally. I think those are generally good ideas. I'm a fan of BEM personally, but honestly, I think that it's ridiculous to have to write them by hand. And so I want to prescribe a tool that will auto BEM all of our component styles. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later, but that tool does not yet exist. I'm in the process of building it, and actually, you have Ian, potentially, to, help, to thank for helping build that tool over at Nest. Um, Shadow DOM is another possible solution. These both have caveats because there are kind of solutions here. Most of the existing solutions are not perfect for one reason or another. Shadow DOM, unfortunately, is one of those solutions that I do not believe is perfect. And I think that I've gone to a lot of uh, effort to like devise a system that works today without Shadow DOM, but is somewhat forward thinking about Shadow DOM and is compatible with that world. Why, what's the, there's, I'm not gonna talk a lot about Shadow DOM, but I'll give you one brief description of why Shadow DOM is kind of not ideal. Shadow DOM is a little bit too much like an iframe for your CSS. What does that mean? It means that imagine in your Ember components, you had to import all of the core styles that you used, every single rule, right? So basically, it's, not awful, but it's hard to iterate towards. And I feel like, in fact, if you write CSS the way that I prescribed, Shadow DOM kind of falls out because you don't write global styles, so you don't have global, you don't have a lot of shared styles and you're gonna write component-specific styles. You're not gonna have a lot of stuff to import in your Shadow DOM. Um, I have some concerns about performance of Shadow DOM too. These are mostly unfounded. I'm just suspicious because if we're gonna tell everybody on the web that they need to like import their common style sheets, then we've got a lot of duplicate style sheets loaded in memory, and we're potentially, we have hundreds of those on a page at a time, and I think they don't really have a, fair, a fully baked shared memory system in mind for these shadow root boundaries and stuff, um, but I'm sure that's gonna come with time. So I don't wanna poo-poo shadow DOM. I think it's a great technology. I just don't think it's as iterative of the technology as we could ideally have. Um, and I've tried to advocate for having some kind of intermediate step, but I've unfortunately not been able to get much traction with that idea on the, uh, the standards and on the, on the browser vendor teams. So TLDR is, I say we can write, we can have conventions for writing our class names globally unique, and we can have tools that make it easy for us to do that by default. Modularity. So this is a bit meaty of a topic. I would, I, would, I would challenge you to rethink the way that you write CSS completely and try to draw parallels with the way that you write JavaScript code. CSS is unlike anything. It's, it's really a kind of bizarre programming system. Programming, I dare call it a programming language. It's, not, it's kind of a weird declarative system, but it's unlike anything else, and I think this is a lot to blame for the problems that we have with it at scale. And so what's an example of this? Well, um, basically there's no concept of a module in CSS, right? We only have the global scope. There is no such thing as like a subscope. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. I think though the good news is that we have preprocessors today that kind of give us faux modularity, 
And it's not perfect, but it, it's a thing we can use to do our jobs today. And it'll be interesting to see. And there are some, there's a bunch of, you know, uh, alternative like systems that are doing good work in this space, but I unfortunately don't think most of them have quite quack, cracked the nut fully. Um, and hopefully I'll have enough time to convince you that maybe I have a little bit, um, or at least get your interest. Because honestly, this talk is probably like one in a series of three. There's a lot of stuff to talk about here. Um, so I'm gonna try to scope this down to the bare essentials. So I want all of these things to be true. I want to be able to delete and refactor CSS, just like I would JavaScript code. And I ideally want to do that feeling confident when I'm doing it. I'm a strong believer that runtime overrides, this is pretty controversial, runtime overrides should be avoided at all costs. Now, that is pretty crazy sounding. What do I mean by runtime overrides? I mean, Basically, I am not a believer in like the bootstrap model of CSS. Uh, so bootstrap, let's say beat button, has a BTN class. If you like BTN, you do BTN default, and then maybe you write your own class that overrides some of the things that BTN default did. I think this is generally a bad idea. Why? Because you can't actually like look at the markup and really like understand what that thing's gonna do. You almost certainly have to open up the dev tools look at the style inspector and like look at what actually happened, right? And, and it's not fun to live in this kind of un unconfident world of writing styles and writing apps. Um, so I would like to see tools that like linted and when it, we could actually catch ourselves when we're trying to override a rule that already existed and it would yell at us and say, you know, kind of like how JS hint would if we'd like declared the same variable twice in a function. Right? I think we probably need something like that. Um, and runtime overrides wreak, they wreak havoc on our ability to refactor. Um, why? Because when somebody overrides us, if we're bootstrap, who's done a bootstrap upgrade? Has anybody done a bootstrap upgrade? It's a disaster, especially if you didn't have the foresight to use variables to do most of your customization. If you did runtime overrides, you're playing whack-a-mole. You're like, why did this rule exist? Oh, it was to override the behavior of Bootstrap 2 that's now, now there in Bootstrap 3, right? So it's, it's insane. And that's why I believe that styling needs a public API for overriding, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about what I mean by that. This is, a, this is the like core tenant, I think, of my belief system around CSS is that we need public APIs for our CSS. We need to treat our CSS like we would treat our components. Components have public APIs. Why don't our styles? I think functions are a really good metaphor to think, to frame your thinking around this stuff. Here is a function. What do functions have? They have arguments and they have return values, right? So you pass data into a function and then it returns something that's likely dependent upon the arguments you passed in, right? Maybe even it's a pure function, that'd be great. No side effects. Here's a component. A component is like a function. You pass arguments into it what does it return? It returns some rendered markup, some rendered DOM that gets appended to our document body, right? Or it's parent element. CSS does not have functions. This is very problematic. This is, I believe, the nail in the coffin of CSS. Good news, SAS does. What are functions in SAS? They're mix-ins. So I dare to suggest that perhaps a pattern like this is quite good for implementing your component styles. What does this give us? Well, it gives us a function, right? What can these functions have? They can have arguments. What does a mix-in return in SAS? It returns a set of rules. Right? 
those rules get, here's our function getting called with that include. Right? Now we could be optionally passing parameters here. It has positional arguments and named arguments. It's quite nice. What's going to happen? Well, whatever rules we define in that mix in are going to get added into our my component class. Right? And here we're, we're going to have a convention. We're going to say that your component should have a, you know, your component has a unique name globally. At the minimum, we should have a class that is coupled to our component name, and that is the, you can almost think of it as like the namespace. It's actually a prefix for all the rules that our component, or all the CSS rules that our component has. All right? So, I believe func so functions are units of work. You cannot have composition without functions. You can, building ambitious apps requires composition. We know this already with components. They're great. We need the equivalent in CSS for composition. Mixins are the closest thing we have to that today. Building ambitious apps also requires conventions to do it at scale. So I've let my first foray, little did I know, I actually wrote this add on Ember Component CSS like during EmberConf last year. And uh, I got, I was like, man, CSS really grinds my gears. And I was like, you know what, there's a lightning talk spot. I'm just going to build a thing and I'm going to start talking about CSS. And I wish I should have gotten a screenshot. I released this thing and I started po posting issues on it about my, my ideas. And then it became like big ass threads of everybody bike shedding the hell out of my ideas and telling me why I couldn't constrain CSS the way that I wanted to, basically. It's too, too crazy. Um, and so that was, that was unfortunate. I don't think it, people are, I, part of the reason I want to give this talk is just to make you aware of the problems you might already have. And I'm, I'm going to lightly sub prescribe some stuff. In further talks, I'm going to actually talk a bit about some of the stuff that I'm building that's going to make, hopefully, some of these things baked into Ember um, and maybe even become part of Ember if I can survive the bike shedding of the core team. Um, so <laughs> component-based CSS, this Ember add-on, Ember component CSS, what this was really about, which I don't think was that shocking of a concept, was that We've got JavaScript files and handlebars files for our components. We should also have a CSS file, right? Most people do this already, but they do it in an ad hoc way. They're probably not diligent about their naming. You know, it's annoying. So this was a system that piggybacked the concepts of pods in Ember CLI and gave you the ability to drop in a CSS file in your pod directory, and it would automatically slurp them all up so you didn't have to write manual at imports or any of that stuff yourself, right? And it did have one, I did the easiest thing I could in the hours of time that I had, you know, did, prescribed for this before going up and talking about it at EmberConf. And that was to basically say the good first step for, uh, behavior that this component could give you is to automatically nest all of your component styles in a globally unique identifier, okay? So what did that look like? It basically just meant you know, everybody's probably familiar with SAS. It meant like you have my component and I actually generate some kind of random number so that you can't guess the name of it. And then I wrap that thing around all your styles. So they're all descendant selectors though, right? I knew at the time that was not ultimately the end game, but it turns out the end game that I've wanted to get to is quite complicated and it's actually difficult to pull off uh, around the constraints that have existed in Ember CLI actually. Um, and there's a lot of unknowns, and it's taken me, basically I wrote this ad on like, what, March 2015, here I am, April 2016, still not done executing on the vision that I have for this add-on, but I'm here to tell you what I'm thinking so that hopefully I can enlist your help um, or convince Robert, and then he'll just do all the work for me. It's quite amazing. <laughs> um, so. Component-based CSS, I think, is a really important concept, and it's not controversial. Everybody's pretty much on board. Um, I also prescribe as a convention BEM. It ultimately doesn't actually matter. 
as long as you have a consistent naming structure that will get you globally unique class names, all right? What the heck is BEM, for those of you who do not know? It stands for, it's an acronym for Block Element Modifier. What does this mean? Well, block basically means component in Ember. Element means some sub area of functionality inside of that component. So let's say you had a button that happens to have a label. Modif the modifier, or the element is like the label tag that you might have inside of your components template, right? And then modifier is things like states, like disabled or active or focused or whatever, the different states that any, that a block or an element might be in. And so you can check out getbem.com. It's really, really basic stuff. It's pretty simple. Um, basically though, what it prescribes is a, a pretty bulletproof way of, I had the wrong page up. It gives you a pretty bulletproof way of naming things where you will not accidentally make mistakes of like using dashes only as delimiters because you actually want to make sure like dashes are valid in component names. So you don't want to like accidentally define rules that happen to end up being the name of a component later on. Um, and so for example here, we've got a modifier. Modifiers use double dashes. So the, imagine this would be like my dash component, double dash hidden or disabled or whatever. Um, there's also um, elements and those use underscores. The reason we're not, we're using double dashes and double underscores here is to differentiate from a single dash which might end up being the name of a component that gets created later on, right? So it's important to have some kind of delimiter here. Um, I envision a system that is not just BEM, but it also adds GUIDs that people can't guess. And this gives us emulated encapsulation and isolation a la Shadow DOM. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but. Um, so my auto BEM add-on would, and Ember Component CSS kinda does this, but basically the idea is that you don't know what the hell your class names are, and I'm gonna write you a clever add-on that you get to write nice CSS the way you would expect to write it in a globally scoped environment. You can write dot urgent, and that's automatically gonna become my component dash dash urgent or underscore underscore urgent or whatever, right? And then you wrote urgent in your components template, and I also transformed that for you as well, automatically, all right? But then I also added these hash, these extra random digits because that prevents somebody who doesn't understand the naming system from accidentally using the CSS somewhere else that was only meant to be used inside of a component itself, okay? So long story short on that. Let's dive into some code. This will be the interesting piece. Um, so, uh, let's see. I didn't really plan this part out too well. Um, so, um, let's look at a very simple example. So, this is without an auto beming tool. Um, so, Here's what a button might look like. This is a fairly complicated button, and unfortunately it has a lot of, it has some theming information baked into it, so it's not super abstract right now. Um, and there's some funky stuff going on here. But basically we've got a mix-in named the same thing. This, the, now I'm starting to prescribe some possible solutions, and I'll try to recap a little bit. Um, we got a mix-in named the same thing as the component. All right, I'll turn, I'll come back to why this is important later. And we got a bunch of rules that are nested inside of that. Now note, most of them, if not all of them, are using ampersand, right? Why is that? Well, because wherever you mix it into, now these rules are going to be concatenated onto the class name that the mixin was applied to, right? And though this is doing prefixing for us, right? So inside of our, uh, our button, we get to kind of write, it's a little ugly with those ampersands, but we don't have to write my component dash dash we use the ampersand to kind of do that for us, right? So um, let's see. Here's a very simple example, right? All in a few lines. Nothing too fancy here. Now, what is nice about this? This mixin has a public API, right? What is its public API? It's these parameters that you can pass in. So if you wanna override my simple button, you can include my SAS file and you can invoke my mixin 
in your own component's class name, and you can provide any overrides that you might want into it. And now I have created an abstraction, right? And this abstraction is very important because I don't want you to write CSS rules for my component. Because what if I let you do that? If I let you do that, then I can never refactor my component out from underneath you ever again. Because you've done the same, you've created the same problem that you had with Bootstrap 2 to Bootstrap 3. Right? You wrote a bunch of rules that were hard coded to the assumptions that I had of my implementation strategy at the time. Right? With something like this, I can actually abstract myself now, just like a component does. Right? You invoke my button component, you don't have to care how I give you a button, how I render it and handle the behaviors. You just get to care that you got a button and there's a click action or something, right? This is the same kind of principle for CSS as well. And I think functions are a minimum, like the minimum requirement to create this kind of abstraction. Let's take it up a notch and let's do some composition. Let's see us actually doing something interesting with these mixins. So I have a default button type. Oops, wrong file. I have a default button type that actually is pretty complicated. It's a pretty a cool button. I've been talking a lot at you, so I'll throw you a bone and show you some demos. So here's my buttons here. They're pretty cool. This is a default button, and it has nice active state, right? It has nice focus ability, right? Here's my primary button. Really, the only difference between my primary button and my default button is that it has a blue border with some gradient. Uh, Right, so actually this is a very cool example because this is actually a gradient border. Who knows how to do this in CSS? A few of people. I'll tell you what, it ain't border colon 1px <laughs> gradient, okay? It's actually really, it's actually challenging. Luckily I have a wizard, CSS wizard, helping me build this shit. Um, so, uh, this actually requires different markup to pull off properly, all right? Now, big teaser, I've actually come up with a great abstraction for how we can do that too, all right? But that's out of scope for this conversation. If you're interested in theming, come talk to me afterwards and I might hire you to help me. Um, so theming, I think, is next level shit and theming requires not just assuming that you can override CSS properties to theme. Because theming requires sometimes different markup for implementation strategies. So you need a delegation pattern for layout to do that well. And if you're clever, you'll figure out the name of this project and you'll see it's wide open on GitHub. You can see what I'm doing. Um, so anyways, point is though basically Primary buttons just have a, like a different font color and a different border, right? So ideally, I don't have to rewrite or duplicate any of this CSS that went into the default button. I should be able to just use its mixin and compose in CSS, right? Well, guess what? I can. Here it is. I got my primary. I use the mixin of my default. Arguably, I, might, I should probably have an add import here but I, I don't currently. Um, button default here, and it has parameters. It has a public API. It has like a background color and a color ar arguments, and I can pass those in. Now the cool thing about this is that my button default knows that borders are gradients, and it actually does some relative stuff. Like you passed in the color, but it's gonna use things like Lighten and Sass to automatically generate the gradient based off the single color you gave me, right? Now, this, is, this gradient border stuff is purely a concern of the, of the button default variant, and it actually doesn't exist in the base class. There's actually a base class of this button, which is Simple, um, and Simple doesn't know anything about fancy gradient borders. It just knows very simple stuff. This is what a simple button looks like right now. It's just like a square, right? 
And the hope is that simple is the base class. I can compose its mixin into default. I can extend it, perhaps, as well. And then primary can extend default. And we have a reasonably robust system of composition that is akin to what we can do today already with components. Right? Um, so there's a little bit of code. Maybe I'll have, I don't, I'm probably way over time already, so I'll try to show you some more. Um, conventions really need to be the default. We need to help you fall into the pit of success when writing CSS. You shouldn't have to be a wizard to do it well. It should just be the default of the framework. I want to release a version a 1.0 of Ember Component CSS that fully integrates my current thinking on these things. And at the minimum, that will be the, the bastion of sanity of CSS in the Ember world. But I am excited because, and part of the thing that's blocking my, my work here is that we actually need to ship our new pods RFC, which Robert probably hates me calling it that, but there's a great modules RFC. Has anybody read, seen this yet? If you're an Ember developer every day and you haven't seen this, get on it right now because we're completely reorganizing your app folders for you. So you might want to know what it's going to look like and tell us if you think it's a bad idea. So check out this RFC. Um, it's actually, and we've got an automated tool. You can go to this RFC. You can check out this rendered output. It's pretty great stuff. I couldn't be happier, and thank you to, you can all thank Robert and Dan Gephardt on the core team for championing this, this effort. But we've got, a, I think, really, really great. If you've used pods, you probably have felt some pain around them. You're using the standard layout, you're probably feeling pain around that. I think this is as good as we can get to bring the two worlds together and have a beautiful file structure for Ember application development from now on. And the cool thing about it is that add-ons, engines, apps are going to all just be the same damn structure. There's not going to be any more wacky like app folder and add-ons and all that stuff. We're going to have namespacing so your add-ons don't clobber the global. The, if you have the add-on that installs a component named the thing in your app, it doesn't like have a, a clobbering problem. Apps win. but you can actually, will be, we'll be able to invoke components with a namespace prefixing them. And it's going to be great, great, great stuff. So check out this RFC. And I'm gonna, my solutions are all built with this in mind. Um, they're future thinking in that regard. And there's actually a great link in here. You can actually see Ember, um, Robert wrote a migrator. And this is Ghost's open source admin app, Ember app. You can actually navigate it. The, the thing of note here is like UI is where most of your UI code lives in now. There's some folders here that are useful. These are kinds of like, you know, this is akin to like the app folder today, kind of, except routes has got a pods-like behavior to it now. Um, it's very, very cool. I really can't, I can't really say anything more about it other than I love it. And it's going to enable some really, really awesome stuff. I'm going to be, I have some crazy ideas about single file components, meaning file components that everything for the component can live in one file. CSS, JavaScript, and markup all in one file using the JavaScript module system. I know I'm bonkers, but this <laughs> system is actually planned for that. It actually just works seamlessly, and it's, it's all just beautiful. So please review this RFC, and we'll hear Robert talk about it tomorrow at LinkedIn. Um, so I intend on writing an RFC to Ember with my viewpoints in them. Um, I don't know when. Uh, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get as many core team members on board first. Primarily Yehuda, and I've already been kind of like thought leading Yehuda about some of this stuff, um, because as like basically, if you win Yehuda, you're pretty much likely to win the rest of the core team over. He's usually the hardest one to to battle. Um, he's the ultimate bike shedder. Um, so I intend on taking these opinions to the core team at some point in the near future via an RFC and hopefully getting these things baked into the framework. Now, you may hate me for this if you do not like the way that I write CSS, um, but I think it's important that we have something. And so if you don't like this stuff, please let me know. And I probably have, I'm, I'm a few steps ahead and 
I know there's some faults that you might think uh, this system has, but there are actually solutions to those things as well, particularly, I'm curious, how many of you are already worried about the bloat of the CSS that will be emitted from the system? Is anybody worried about that yet? Guess what? We're gonna build the best frickin' optimizer that ever existed for CSS because we have whole system knowledge. We know what the classes are you're actually using. We could tree shake unused rules in your CSS. We could do anything we want here. Um, so really, it's just a matter of putting in the blood, sweat, and tears to make this system work and be as optimal as possible on like the emitted CSS output. But we've already, I'm already thinking about that stuff and there's a, there's a plan for how we can do that. It's really just a resource problem. Like we just need volunteers to help build this stuff um, because I can't do it all myself. Um, and so I think uh, responsive, uh, responsive design needs a rethink. Um, uh, Responsive design, actually, the way we do it today, here's another controversial thing, I think it's actually just wrong. It's like really bad, the way that we do responsive design. Um, flexi is actually a thing that already exists out there. This is based off of, so I've been gone for like a year. I started writing some of these things as add-ons that never got released. Flexi is actually an extraction of my layout system that I was building. And it has responsive design concepts built in. If you have not seen Flexi yet, go look at it. It's pretty cool. It's not perfect. But what if I told you you could have templates that were specific to the breakpoints in your application? And they automatically just rendered when that breakpoint was hit. So you can actually have, you can use if statements if you want to. You can say, if it's mobile, show this. If not, you can do that kind of stuff in a grand in like one big template, or you can break out the mobile view for your component as a separate template, the de tablet view of your component as another one. They have this kind of stuff in iOS, it's called adaptive layout, and they have storyboards that are specific for different platforms. This is kind of taking some of those ideas and bringing them to Ember and the web. Um, and also Flexi is an abstraction on top of Flexbox. So I'm really interested in, in layout as well. Layout's a huge problem. Wouldn't it be great if you could just have a two column layout by saying H box, 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 that's what Flexi is. It's a two column layout, it'll be 50%. It has a grid system. Check out Flexi, it's really cool. And it's, it, I'm thankful to Runspired for taking some of that work and um, making it real. So like I said, I need your help. And I'm even maybe willing to hire you to do so. I have some budget for this. The thing is, I've done a lot of consulting at a lot of companies. Um, every company I work for, has problems, these problems, and I'm really fed up with it. And so I'm actually like spending my own damn money to fix some of these problems. Um, and I'm getting my clients on board too to help fund this work. And so if you're interested in helping, please get in touch. So I flew through that. Um, I'm sure you guys have some questions. Let's fire away. How much time do we have? Three questions, great. Um, how do you see like HTML bars playing into this? I feel like we have a lot of control over the structure. Yep. Of the, the HTML bar stuff. So let me, let me, I think I skipped over some important bits uh, in the name of time. So the optimizer. So here's the big problem with this system. I'll tell you the fault with it right now and then I'll tell you how we're going to solve it. When you look at the outputted CSS of this system with mixins, you are going to end up with a ton of duplicated CSS rules. Mixins aren't doing any kind of clever optimizations currently in SAS. Basically, every time you include a mixin, every time you want to create a subcomponent that's going to use its parent component styles, you're going to get a complete copy of all of the styles from the parent component. And that can be cost prohibitive. Right? So let's take a quick peek here. I think this stuff lives in vendor CSS. Um, so Here's like my simple SAS output. Close the console. So, hey, what the hell? Go away. Um, so, let's see if I can find some duplicate styles. So here's default button. Um, so here's all the default button styles. Guess what? We keep going a little lower. We're gonna find primary button. Here's all the same duplicated styles that are actually mostly identical with default button. 
SAS has a mechanism to solve this problem called placeholders. We can be clever, and I'm hoping some of the automation that Ian and I are going to do is going to enable some of these things to automatically become placeholders in your mixins. And then that will allow placeholders, which actually are pretty cool in SAS. If you define rules as placeholders, they will share the rules, and you'll just get like comma separated selectors for everything that shares the common set of rules. Now, this can be problematic with SAS. You actually need to actually, the way you can do this effectively is you actually, the way you do this today manually, there's a great article I should have linked to. You basically separate the static bits and the dynamic bits as two separate placeholders. And then the, the, the static rules will get all shared across every subclass, but the dynamic bits will be unique per class. I think we can automate that. I really think we can automate that stuff away. Um, so tools are going to be important to kind of making this succeed. Um, what else can we do? Well, placeholders are cool and all, but they're pretty manual. What if we can actually just analyze the rules that are omitted and actually find all the common rules, create classes that just define those rules? And if we understand, we've got Ember CLI, we've got this great build system, we have full system knowledge about the markup and the JavaScript and the CSS, we can actually look at the dependency graph of your CSS rules, find all the common stuff, create hoisted, we can hoist the rules up to like global classes, and our templates can automatically include those classes. What is this thing? It's basic, who's, used ever, who's ever done functional CSS or atomic CSS? There's some people, I'm sure. Anybody, no? Basically, they're kind of an interesting group of people that are saying every property combination of CSS rules should be defined as its own unique class. It's kind of a little out there, but the cool thing about it is that actually, it's, it's basically just the optimization by, that I'm envisioning by hand. If you can find all the common sets of rules and hoist them and create classes for them, you can even minify those classes with this optimizer, by the way. You could minify your CSS classes, and the templates will automatically get rewritten to use the modified classes and stuff like that. Um, anyways, I wish I had, I don't have a demo of this. It would be cool to see, but hopefully my description makes sense and or at least interests you. Yes, it's absolutely. You have to make it in the right yeah, I agree. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> when, uh, you mentioned having a full knowledge of CSS. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with like what the uh, what, like the, the abstract tree for SAS looks like, or what a popular CSS parser abstract tree might look like that you can modify. What are the options? And yeah. So right now we're planning. So there's a few different ones out there. Right now we're planning on using Salesforce wrote a great SS, SCSS parser that we're planning on using. CSS parser. SCSS parser. So this lets you just give it SCSS and it will create an AST for you that you can transform and you can analyze. And basically, we've got like in Ember the ability to build the mother of all ASTs. We can build an AST of your CSS, we can build an AST of your HTML, we can build an AST of your JavaScript. We can analyze the whole system and we can optimize the crap out of it for you automatically. It's just gonna take effort to build that. Um, and it's valuable because we get to then write our style. I mean, it's a lot of effort, you might think. Maybe atomic CSS or functional CSS is better in the short term. But ultimately, we want to be able to write our CSS like we write our components, right? Like we write functions, like we write JavaScript. And that's going to mean having concerns localized on the, in the component CSS file, right? Like you're going to just want to be able to write the simple rules and then let the system deal with optimizing it for you. Uh, Post CSS has a CSS parser. There's a numerous number of CSS ones. Um, I'm basically, what controversial thing I'm thinking is basically as SAS is one, so we should probably just use SAS by default. Sorry, Post CSS fans. Um, I like Post CSS, honestly. I, we're going to use it for some of this work because uh, it's easier to transform the ASTs with Post CSS than SAS directly right now, but SAS is, I think, kind of the winner, although. I would like to write my own CSS preprocessor on top of Glimmer 2, but I don't, that's a whole nother level of crazy. So um, anyways, uh, yeah, so and that, one last question and then I'll leave you alone. Oh, no, no more questions. Anybody have one pressing? All right, we can talk afterwards. Um, so um, 
I hope I was not so ridiculously over time. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening to me ramble about this stuff. Hopefully, I've piqued your interest. You're going to see me giving more talks about this. I'm going to keep, these talks are going to get recorded. I'm going to keep honing my message, and hopefully, you'll make sense out of all this stuff that I've been saying, and it will make sense to you, and you'll want to use it, and maybe you'll even want to help me build this stuff, because I think it's really important for the future of web development. So thank you very much. Thank you.